Welcome, welcome. Thank you to those who are registering in. We'll just take a couple of moments. My name is Hafiz Rashid. We'll do a formal opening in just a few moments as more participants enter the room. Please make sure to copy the links that are on your screen for those of you who are listening. Tinyurl.com backslash digital story KBFUS will be the presentation link. Please take note of the links on your screen. And we'll also have an interactive platform. Slido interactive survey link, tinyurl.com backslash Slido story, S-L-I-D-O story. Yeah, um, right presentation link. And you can also, as uh, Liz pointed out in the chat, you can also see the uh, uh, presentation link as well. We'll take about 30 more seconds and then we'll begin. Just a note for those that are seeing the presentation links on your screen, they are available in the chat to just copy and paste into your browser. You can follow along with the presentation by clicking on the presentation link, tinyurl.com backslash digital story KBFUS. And when prompted, you'll be invited to provide your questions at the tinyurl.com backslash Slido story. Okay, hello and welcome. I am Hafiz Rashid, the Senior Advisor, Communications and Outreach at the King Budwin Foundation, United States. It's great to be here and thank you for taking the time today to attend the first episode of the October series on digital marketing. For those of you who are unfamiliar with KBFUS, please allow me a brief word. The King Bodwin Foundation United States facilitates thoughtful, effective giving to Europe and Africa and beyond. We enable US donors to support their favorite causes overseas. We also provide European and African nonprofits with cost effective solutions to raise funds in the United States through a tool we call an American Friends Fund. We have over 450 American Friends Funds, including the University of Nairobi in Kenya, and the Karolinski, Karolinska Institute in Sweden, among many, many others. These funds save nonprofits in Europe and Africa the trouble and expense of setting up their own US public charity. We handle all back office administration, including tax receipts and donor support. So if you have donors in the US, feel free to reach out to me and we'll be happy to assist. And by the way, if you have donors in Canada, in Europe or in Asia, feel free to reach out as well as we have partners that can help you with donors in these countries and regions as well. And what I've been most looking forward to, I'm excited to introduce to you your presenter, Liz Ngonzi, who's also my own coach on digital marketing. Liz is the founder and CEO of the International Social Impact Institute, which through initiatives with my organization, KBFUS, the Nelson Mandela University of South Africa, and the Resource Alliance in the United Kingdom and many others, 
level the playing field for social impact leaders and organizations uh, with whom serve historically underserved and marginalized communities around the world by providing access to the resources, knowledge, and networks that will enable those leaders and organizations to thrive despite the various op obstacles they have so often encountered. As an adjunct assistant professor at New York University, Liz teaches digital storytelling, innovation and fundraising, and planning and executing virtual events and fundraisers, both of which are part of the professional certificate program in digital fundraising she recently developed. Liz holds a BS degree in information systems from Syracuse University and an MMH degree from Cornell University. Liz will be sharing her expertise today. So no, you do not have to join New York University. Um, we're very excited to have her. And I just have a few other points to make. Contact information will be made available following this webinar. This session is being recorded and our presenter Liz Ngozi will address questions at specific points of the discussion. But I would like you to encourage you to make full use of the Q&A feature throughout this presentation. Without much further ado, I present to you Liz. Thank you so much, Hafiza. I'm so excited to be here with you uh, virtually. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, of course, to share um, some of my knowledge and experience with the group. Everybody, this is going to be a truly interactive experience, so I highly recommend that you copy the link uh, to the presentation as well as the Slido, intra uh, Slido interactive survey link, because uh, I want to make sure I'm not talking at you, even though we're not together we'll be able to create this experience together. So please do make sure that you uh, take advantage of that. All right, and thank you so very much to King Bud One Foundation US, Giving Tuesday, African Resource Network, Candid, European Fundraising Association and Nigerian Network of NGOs for supporting our efforts here uh, to help you learn about how to use digital storytelling and fundraising to activate your donors. So today we're going to learn about how to craft story that inspire and activate donors. We're going to learn about how to effectively engage donors online. And we're going to talk about how to share your organization's story via social media, because I think that's also something you're interested in. And, and then we're going to, I'm going to provide with you some information about additional events we've organized to help you prepare for Giving Tuesday, which is just coming up real soon, and some other resources that can um, help with your further learning. All right, so we're going to start with our very first Slido poll. My question is, what is the biggest challenge your organization faces when engaging donors? When you um, either use the links that are in the chat or the ones that I showed you beforehand, or go ahead and, cl and click the QR code, um, you will be able to respond and your response will show up on the screen. So make sure you're happy with the response you give and it's completely anonymous. So please share what is the biggest challenge your organization faces when engaging donors. I'm gonna give you a couple um, moments to do so because I know that there's a sort of a time difference. Okay, staffing, yeah. So maybe it's, is it staff, maybe it's staff, uh, experience level, um, training, time, <laughs> okay. What else do we have? How to strike a balance between informal, informational and building two-way relationships. Yes, and it's very important that we look at creating mutually beneficial relationships and that we're not just completely just looking at donors as sort of our meal ticket, but understanding that we're creating a relationship as, with either an institution that's run by people or individuals who, uh, with whom we can really, um, you know, solve the problems that we've, just, um, you know, as organizations are choosing to do. Uh, lack of worthy information that meets the interests of donors. Okay, resources, staff, and time. Lack of board support. Yeah, it's really important to have a good board that's supporting you. Getting institutional stories uh, and being able to segment. Uh, understanding how to retain the interest of your donors to give more in the future. Yeah, so that's really how do you develop that long-term relationship that will, will inspire them to continue to be supporters of the work that you do, okay? How to, um, 
Let's see, is your cause is our cause justified for support support over others? Yeah. So have you been able to uniquely demonstrate your value pro or demonstrate your unique value proposition? And the board doesn't know how to use the money and it's hard to, to ask for more. Wow. So that sounds like there's some um, accountability um, and stewardship issues around there. That's a real big problem. You need to have the trust um, of your donors um, and then attracting new donors, all right? Segmenting list. All right, so you can continue to respond to this if you'd like to, but this is really how we're going to interact today so that it gives me a sense of what's on your mind and how I can kind of tailor a little bit of the content towards some of the issues that you have outlined here. Um, but we see that the segmentation is really, really important. Um, engaging audiences on different social media channels um, and understanding the time frame from research to application. Okay. Um, and then finding the right organization to match funding. Make them understand why us and not others. Yeah, again, it's your unique value proposition. So I'm going to talk about this um, as, as we continue going forward. So I'm going to go ahead and move on to my next slide, but you'll be able to continue answering and um, I'll, I'll be able to get a sense of some of the other challenges that you've been sharing. No CRM. Yeah, it's important to have a CRM. All right, so let's start off by learning how to develop stories that inspire and activate donors. Um, so this is Sesame Street. I don't know about you, but you know, I, I think Sesame Street is kind of ubiquitous in that you know, no matter where you are in the world, someone Sesame Street has um, either a program or they have their books and so on and so forth. But you know, donors are just people like you and I who learn and are inspired by, through and are inspired by stories, right? And so you think about how we started as little kids as we listen to stories, and you know, in, in particular different contexts, it could be um, stories told to you, you know, from your culture. Um, or books that, you, that you're reading, but we really need to understand that that's how we as human beings uh, communicate. So it's important that when we as a nonprofit organizations are communicating to our donors that we do so through telling and sharing of our stories. I wanna make a note to you that every, every single um, content that I'm providing to you has a source link. So if you wanna learn more, if you wanna see more, you can go ahead and click on them and, 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 and access the additional information. All right. Therefore, you have to attract donors, you have to do so by developing well-crafted stories that persuade them to act. Okay. So, and for so those stories to um, persuade those donors to act, they must express what makes your organization unique and worthy of attention and support, which really speaks to some of the challenges you all shared with me. They must connect to the donor's values. If you don't understand what your donor's values are and what's important to them, then how are you really going to activate them, you know? Um, and also needs to enable donors to see the potential impact they can make on your cause. Um, you know, you have to make them the heroes of the story. You have to show how they really are making a very, very big difference by partnering with you. Um, and I'll share how you do so. And of course, you always have to pile a call to action. So you want someone to comment, to share, subscribe, register, donate, if, you know, online, but you always must ask them to do something, you know, so whether you're, um, you know, sending out an e-blast or you um, are, creating a social media post, or even on your website, there must always be a call to action. And I can't tell you how frequently I look at people's content or organization's content, and there's no call to action. Like you spend all this great time creating compelling content, but you don't tell me what you want me to do. So that's important for us to recognize. So I'm going to share with you a very simple storytelling framework. There are much more complicated ones out there, but I always feel like let's keep it simple so you can remember it. All right. So it has four components. There's a problem, there's a solution, an impact, and an ask. The problem really relates to, you know, what 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 is your organization solving for your beneficiaries, right? You know, sort of like what is what's its reason for being? What's the problem that they have that you're able to uniquely solve? And then the solution is how your organization uniquely solves their problems, right? So, if, you know, whether it's you're an educational institution, so it's, it's through education, or if it's food for, through feeding schemes or, or, or cultural institutions and what have you, and then uh, the impact. And see, a lot of times when we report impact, we're really reporting results, right? So 10,000 people went through our program, 5,000 people went through. That's important. Those are results. But your impact is really why your organization's ma solution matters to your beneficiaries, your donors, and society, society large. So what are the bigger implications of that? And then, of course, you want to have some kind of ask, the action that you want your donor to take as a result of listening to, experiencing, um, viewing your story. And I'm going to give you some examples of this in, in, um, in real time.
So let's look at this page from UNICEF. I think everyone knows is familiar with UNICEF. This is on their website. So if you go onto their website, what I've done is I've taken the storytelling framework and I'm showing you the different pieces of the website and how they've integrated the elements into it. So here, you know, so the sort of the darker purple is the problem, the lighter purple is the solution, impact is kind of the aqua color, and then the red is the ask, right? So if you can see right here, they already start with, you know, what their solution is, right? They, they you know, they, they drive change for children and young people every day across the globe. They're not very specific, but that's really what they're talking about as they do that. Um, find out is like, they're really trying to get you to learn more about what they're doing. Like, they don't just want you to read this, they want you to go deeper, um, whether it's to donate or to, um, read more. Um, and then if you go over here, it says UNICEF works in over 190 countries and territories to save children's lives, to defend their rights, and help them fulfill their potential from early childhood through adolescence, and we never give up. So in here, they combine the um, solution and the problem together. So the problem is kind of implied that, you know, kids need to, you know, they need to be able to have their rights defended. Um, and so they're, you know, speaking about working with vulnerable children. Um, and so you get that, to, get to see that there. And then of calls to action are everywhere. You've got, you know, explore, donate, take action and so on and so forth. So they're really, really clear that they want you to do something after just seeing that one little piece. And you can go to their website to learn more. This is an example of one of King Budwan Foundation's uh, U.S.'s, um, uh, you know, partners, uh, Akira Chicks, which is a really great organization based out of Kenya, um, and they work with with young women. And so this is an example of their giving page, and they're specifically fundraising for Giving Tuesday. Um, again, we have the the storytelling framework, and up here they already say, "Join us in providing education, economic opportunity to young women." Right. So they already. They're already asking you to, to, to get involved. Um, this is all, all call to action over here as well. And then if you actually read through um, all of this, and it's small, so you can read it at home on your own. It says that, you know, um, as part of Akira Chick's fundraising efforts, this Giving Tuesday, two groups of alumni are fundraising 5,000 each to support the next class of co um, uh, Code Hive uh, students is part of realizing the promise of the hand up honor system to give back to those coming after them. So they, they have a combination in here of the problem and the solution. Um, and then you if you kind of start reading down then they have the impact uh, and then they have another call to action. And so I'll let you lo look at this on your own um, because it's tiny for me to read on here, but you'll get a sense for that. The next thing is uh, from Congo. Um, this is an organization that um, is really trying to support, um, you know, women and girls in the Congo. What I think is really, really smart is right up front, they say women are the vi first victims of war, but only they hold the unique key to peace, right? So right there, they're telling you straight up what the problem is, right? And then they continue and give you um, the solutions that they're providing. So you have the solution here, you've got the solution here, and then you've got the impact um, of, over here as well. It says, we know that the bright brave women and girls working at the grassroots level have the solutions. We know that when women become agents of change, they benefit, their families benefit, their communities benefit. So they're really, the, what they're really trying to show you is that you can empower these women to be, you know, to, to make this kind of an impact. So you're really like a champion um, of them. Um, and then they're here, they go ahead and say, generous individuals like you make our work possible. So they're really already flattering um, the donor um, and showing that the impact, the kind of impact that the donor can make. And here, there are two calls to action. One, they want you to start your own fundraiser and or they want you to donate, right? And of course they want you to share. So that's really clear what you what they want you to do as a result of having read this. And there's a video you can watch as well. Video is so, 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 so important in any of your storytelling, whether it's on your website, through your social media and the like, because outside of someone coming to visit your project or coming to visit your organization, it's the most sort of compelling way for you to share a little bit about what your work is all about. So I um, absolutely encourage organizations to have videos. And I don't mean that you have to spend a ton of money on these very slick productions. Um, at, this, at this point, you know, if you've got a phone and, you know, decent um, a phone, you can actually capture um, a really great story because what matters is, is it's authentic um, and that it's compelling. It's not so much about the great, the quality of the production as much as the story. So just one little note I want to share with you.
All right, so I want you to now do something for me. I want you to just quickly go on your website, your organization website, and see if your content or incorporates the following storytelling elements, right? So, so if we go on your homepage or on the about page, um, you know, are you clearly identifying your problem? Are you identifying the solution that your organization uh, provides? Um, are you demonstrating the impact? And are you really clear about what you want your donor to do? So I'm going to give you a few moments because I know that might take a little bit of time for you to scan, but um, let's go ahead and maybe do a couple minutes. Okay, so um, I will go ahead and give you a couple of minutes and I'm reading a question. So I'm having the questions texted to me. So what is a good rule of some balancing declaration of problem solution? But how to too much. Okay, so um, the question really asks, like, how, how, how much you emphasize the problem versus the solution versus the impact versus the ask. Here's what I typically see organizations do, right? They focus so much on the solution um, and really the problem. That's where, that's because that's what they're doing, right? They really, really, really um, tend to emphasize that. But the impact is really, really important because the impact gives you an opportunity to show how you're different. It shows that, you know, that you're, you're, you're not just educating, let's say people so that they can, you know, increase the graduation rates, but you're ultimately um, enabling young people to reach their full potential, to be able to contribute to society more, to add to peace and security and li the like. Um, and then you're also welcoming the, the donor to participate in that, which is, you know, making them a hero and making them part of a larger story. So I would say to you that it's really important that you understand that impact piece. And I'm going to show you a video later that I think does a really great job of balancing all those out um, and really demonstrating impact in a way that a lot of folks don't really see um, being demonstrated. So now I'm giving you a couple of um, moments to go ahead and research your organization's website. I'm just gonna go ahead and give you a slide on this. So, um, you know, does your organization's content uh, incorporate the four elements of the storytelling framework? So it's yes, no, I don't know, we don't have a website. So um, I would just love to have your answer quickly, that'd be great. Yes, oh good, all right, yes. The no's are kind of coming, I don't know, okay. All right, and I do recognize that this is a short period of time to try to do this analysis, but I just want to get you thinking this way. I do this with my students. We actually literally go through websites. We're going to do that tonight. We go through the websites to see how all the different elements are incorporated so that it gives us an opportunity to figure out how to um, you know, improve that way that we're telling that story and bring in that impact piece. And of course, the ask. The ask is so, so, so important. A lot of times we don't inc incorporate that ask. So it looks like we're about 50, so about 52% yes, 41% no, you don't know, okay. Well, the good news is that you all have a website or it seems like you all, have the all of you respondents have websites. So that's really, really good to know because um, it's a digital world that we live in and especially with COVID having um, sort of brought our a lot of our engagement online, it's really, really important that as organizations, we have some kind of a presence. So um, I'm gonna continue moving forward, but I thank you for doing that exercise. And I encourage you to continue doing that, to look at your social media content, to look at your, um, you know, any any letters that you're writing, any email e blasts that you're sending out, making sure that you're incorporating those four elements into um, your storytelling. All right, let's continue on. Let's now talk about how we take all of this online, okay? Um, normally, when I teach at New York University, I teach seven weeks and, I, and, and my, my students, who are all professionals working in the sector, um, create a digital strategy. And that's, in fact, what I did with Hafiz is for digital coaches. We created a digital strategic plan for King Bud Wine Foundation US. But basically, you have all these different elements. And it's very important that if you're going to engage in anything online, that you're not just sort of haphazardly um, you know, updating your website or just haphazardly uh, posting social media, but you actually have have a story that you start with, right? Really crafting that story. And it's, it has to be really linked to your mission statement. I'm gonna talk a little bit about decision science later, um, but this is really around your storytelling. And then you wanna do like a SWOT analysis to understand what you, what things currently look like. How is our site viewed right now? Um, you know, 
how many how many viewers how many how many how many followers do we have how much engagement do we get with our content uh, what are some of the challenges that we face when we're trying to engage online um, and then you know what our competitors look like um, and then we want to look at creating sort of smart goals that are that we can actually measure to, to, to help us improve our online engagement uh, figure out what kind of metrics we're going to use to monitor and and measure our engagement online so is it that we're creating a given Tuesday campaign. So what we're going to be looking at is, you know, percentage of new donors or, um, you know, or, or, or total, total amount raised um, on that particular day. We have to be able to look at that. And then we'll look at our channels to understand what are some of the challenges we face when we're trying to gauge, whether it's on Facebook, on our website, um, and so on and so forth. They may have to do with um, our, 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 our inability to pay for maybe Facebook ads, because at this point, if you're going to be on Facebook, you do need to have an ad because um, there's really suppressing the content. Um, or on your website, uh, maybe your website is slow, um, but really understand where those challenges are and then figuring out what are the resources you need to be able to address them. Um, and then finally, uh, the next two steps, you look at developing a content and fundraising strategy so that we're really clear about you know, exactly what we're going to do, all the different steps. And then we have a communications plan that we um, uh, roll out and then we just execute. So these are the pieces that would be covered if you were to teach, take a long course with me. For today, I'm just going to give you tips and, and, and quick um, strategies that should help you. All right. So let's talk about this. When you're when your organization is um, you know, telling its story online, you must be mindful about the following. Oh, okay, just give me one second. Uh, donors' needs and the drivers of the decision-making. I'm going to show, give you examples of this. Uh, you have to really understand how people think and how to activate them given an organization's lack of, relative lack of, of visibility online, right? If you're not a UNICEF, you're not a Save the Children, you're really not going to have that kind of visibility, the, 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 the you know, the, the, the kind of mind share that other those kinds of organizations have. So how do you really call attention to yourself? There's also a quite a prevalence of fraud online. And in fact, uh, since COVID, that fraud has gone up even more. So how do we differentiate ourselves and show that we are like, you know, that we are uh, legitimate as organizations online to help make sure that organ that that our donors don't feel like if they support us, they're going to be in trouble or they're going to be hacked. Um, and then also um, the amount of information online. There's so much online constantly. So how do you really help people to kind of um, you know, how do you how do you different your, differentiate yourself and enable people to discover your content when there's they're inundated all the time? I mean, the number of emails I get every day, um, the posts on every single platform I'm on, it's very, very overwhelming trying to keep up with all of it. So how do you get my attention? All right. So. I want to share this 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 report, and this is from Salesforce. This is a great report, and this is really a, a very important when you're thinking about how to craft your messaging and the, sort of the donor engagement, right? So what happens is you need to understand what donors' needs are at the very beginning. Let's say the very first time a donor interacts with you, they just need to become aware of your organization. They need to understand what you're doing, um, you know, um, what you're all about and what are the different opportunities, right? Once you do that, then you have to build trust with them, right? And so it's about being consistent in your message, messaging. It's about being transparent around how the money is used. Um, someone mentioned that the board members in their organization really didn't use the money correctly. That's a problem. Um, and then, you know, really, really, you know, creating that trust. It, this is all about trust. It's very important to have that. And then the next is really, um, creating connection to them, right? And that, that really helps the donors feel like they want to be around you for a long time. You don't want to have a relationship with a donor that's a one-time relationship. You really want it to be a longer-term relationship. One, because there is what they call the lifetime value of the donor is really worth it for you. It's just in the same way in the private sector. You don't want to over a year have to find new customers. You want to be able to keep your customers with you and loyal. So that means that you really have to manage those relationships in such a way that they feel connected to you and they feel like they want to continue to engage with you. Um, and then the next is really ownership. When you've really managed that relationship in such a way that you're connecting to their values, you are creating value for them, you're showing them how they can be involved. Um, then you get to a point where they start feeling like, 
the organization is sort of part of theirs and they're, you know, they're volunteering, they're really, maybe they want to be on the board and things like that. And ultimately you want to get them to a point where they're promoting you, right? So now they're creating fundraisers on your behalf. They are opening doors for you and the like. If you really manage that relationship correctly, that is what's going to happen. So I want you to take a look at the report from Salesforce, which you can download um, and really learn a little bit more about this. This is a very high level overview, but the key that I want you to understand here is try to develop long-term relationships with your donors. All right, let's go to the next, um, um, which really speaks to what, what really drives donors' decision-making, right? And it's really consistent with kind of some of the stuff I said before. Um, you know, what re donors, and this is from, um, uh, actually from a Black Bot report, which is a really good charitable giving report that you can take a look at. And what they say is that, you know, um, Organiz donors are really interested in understanding that you're efficient as an organization, right? Like how are you, man you're managing operations and everything in an efficient manner, right? They wanna know what your impact is, right? Um, and because of how that connects with their impact. They wanna understand that you have a good reputation, right? They also wanna connect to the, the mission services so that you have to have the really clearly defined um, mission um, that's then told through your stories and the way that they engage with you um, and your operating costs. Like if you are bringing in, you know, X amount of funds every year and you're using, you know, a significant amount of them for salaries, that's a problem, right? So how are you really managing all of your costs? Um, you know, are executives or overpaid? Um, and then, you know, having a diversity of of funding sources because you don't want to you don't want to be that organization that only has one funder just a couple because if one of them goes away then you're really in the lurch so a funder wants to see that you are diversified in your funding sources so those are some of the things you might look at it's a great report that covers a lot more than this but um just wanted to give you an overview of that so um, in light of all that, here's how you can tell your story to your donors. And this is what I call um, a digital storytelling ecosystem. Now, you're not, I don't expect you to have um, all of these different channels. This is ideal digital storytelling ecosystem. And I'm going to outline it for you. At the very center should be your organization's website. Um, and I'm also going to say LinkedIn profile. I wrote an article that I will share later um, about this. LinkedIn is a very, very critical part of your digital storytelling. And I'll almost say to you that if you don't have a presence on any other social media channel, that's where you need to be because that's the number one professional platform in the world. And so if you're really trying to connect with like foundations, you're trying to connect with high net worth individuals, you're trying to connect with folks who are professionals, that's where they are. That's the platform where, where you'll find them. So I wanna make sure that you really are um, taking advantage of that. And even if let's say your website doesn't really have a lot of visibility, LinkedIn always will come up high just because of the algorithms and just, you know, sort of the, the scope of the of, of the platform. So th those are in sort of the, the mothership. That's where like the most of, of what's happening should be going on for your organization. And then these are nodes, um, you know, so charity rating sites. So depending on where you are, I know some of you from uh, you know outside of the U.S., you're in Europe, uh, you're on the African continent. Um, you probably have charity rating sites that might be um, maybe government run. Um, and so making sure that you have a presence on those sites and that, you know, if there's any kind of information, you've got to provide them your financials, um, information about your organization and so on and so forth, that you have all of that updated and that and that it's pointing to your website. And then on your own website, you're actually even showcasing that. And I'll give you an example of how, how you can do that a little bit later. The next one is really looking at media coverage and thought leadership. So it's really important to have third parties who are endorsing you, right? So if, if, if you've gotten any kind of media coverage around the work that you're doing, that's a third party saying that your work is good. It's legitimizing what you're doing. And the thought leadership is really looking to show that you're experts in whatever um, space you, you work in. So you want to have those pieces and you want to make sure that those pieces, if they're living on a, on a different platform, that they, put, that they, they send people back to your site um, and vice versa. If you're going to be um, using any volunteer recruitment sites, those are usually also many websites that give you an opportunity to um, have people discover you and then also ultimately learn more on your website. Then any of the social media platforms, you want to drive people back to the site. Your email campaigns, the same. Um, so if your email campaigns are promoting um, events that you have coming up or they have any kind of, they're promoting any thought leadership you've created or whatever it may be, you want to make sure that, the, that, that they're driving to your site. And then any virtual events and meetings, like how we're doing our virtual events and meeting, virtual meeting right now or event, um, we're driving people to our website so that they can learn more and they can engage with us further. 
Um, and then investing in Google ads, um, which for nonprofit organizations, if you're qualified and in most countries, you can actually um, receive a Google ad grant, uh, which enables your visibility as an organization to be a lot higher because people can find you using specific keywords um, that, that you know, they're looking, they're searching for when they're looking for an organization like yours, even if they don't know your name. Um, the other that's really, really key is having a presence on your partner sites. So um, King Baudouin Foundation US um, is obviously offers a lot of different types of services, but um, it also um, among those services is, is, is fu functioning as a fiscal sponsor. And so if you were to go onto their uh, Network for Good page, you'd be able to see all the different organizations through which you can uh, donate. Um, and it actually is giving those organizations credibility because it's showing that they're affiliated with a trusted brand. And so um, in the case where you have a funder, in the case where you have you know, any kind of a partner that has legitimacy, you wanna make sure that you have a presence there and that there's also drive people to your site because when someone's researching you, these are all the different things they're going to find. And so this is how, what helps to make uh, a legitimate profile for your organization. And then finally, if you receive any kind of awards, make sure that they profile you and they have a link back to your website and by, by, vice versa. So this is your ideal digital storytelling ecosystem. I don't expect you to be everywhere. I just want you to think about all these different pieces. So um, one organization is Akira Chicks that I showed you before, and that's um, one of King Baudouin Foundation US's partners. I Googled them. And so what I did was I literally just went through and I said, okay, on the first page of results, what do I find? So you've got at the very top is their website. Um, after that are links to their social media. Um, you got social media here as well, as well as here. And there's their LinkedIn profile. Um, and then they have a Google ad over here. Um, and then they've got um, some video content, some media that they either it's media featuring them or that they've created. Um, and then this is a, um, their, their, their Crunchbase um, public uh, page, which is important because that's a site where their professionals are located. And then here's their, their, their page on the Siegel Family Foundation, which is one of their funders. Um, and that's really important that you can find them on there because if I'm researching them, I see, oh, Siegel supports them, then I know that they've embedded, right? I know that gives me a, a center, certain level of comfort with, with them as an organization. And then they're, where they blog, um, and then they were featured in Vogue. So this is just kind of like an overview. If you search Akira Chicks, obviously it's gonna be different depending on the country in which you are, but this gives you a sense of what people can find when they um, are searching your organization. So what I want you to do is I want you to go ahead and, and um, Google your organization and I want you to reuse digital presence very quickly. So just look at that first page and see, you know, are, are you seeing any of these different elements? Are you, you know, you know, your presence on a charity rating site? So in the US, that might be on GuideStar or um, Network for, for Good. Um, and are you getting any kind of media coverage that we can find? Um, do you, you know, are, are your social media platforms uh, visible? The like, so go ahead and take a couple of moments and do that. And I'm going to look at questions that are coming to me. Okay, so I want you to go ahead and see what you find when you Google your organization. Okay. Um, and so for those of you who may be just joining us now, um, let's go ahead and you're gonna do the poll again for them. Thank you. So we're gonna do another poll. All right, so I'm getting some questions that you've sent to me. So just give me one second as I look them up, folks. Okay. Okay, so the digital strategy development framework, um, you want more information. I, I, that's, I really can't cover more about it, but if you go on my website and we'll be giving a link to it, in fact, I'll, of course, you drop the link to the site on our thought leadership page, you should be able to find some information about 
other webinars I've done where I've actually covered that, or you can teach my, take my course at New York University. Um, and then we also have, um, um, actually, I have, I have a couple of courses that I'm developing for Canada that will be out in November that take you through the whole whole process. So if you re, if you if you register for my newsletter, I can make sure that you re receive the information when it comes out. Um, but you're asking, this, I have a question here from someone in Deep Sleuth. Hello, <laughs> how are you? Um, I have multidisciplinary projects. Do you prepare? The story per project as all can be done on landing page or any suggestion. So if you're talking about, you know, having this on your website, um, it's important that all of the projects fit together. So the story really, it, it has to tie back to your mission statement. Your mission statement has, should have all those elements that I shared with you. Then everything you write from there, you know, sort of comes from, from that. And so if you're trying to really um, promote these Multi, multi, multidisciplinary projects, there has to be a thread that kind of connects all of them. And then you can, you can specify um, information about each particular project, but it has to be related to your mission. It has to be related to your story and why you exist as an organization. Okay. Um, I have another question here. Um, okay. My organization doesn't have a lot of staff. What are the top three steps I should take to increase my organization web visibility? Well, um, most organizations don't have a lot of staff, but I would say that I would do a SWOT analysis, like I said. So understand strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats on your website. Um, I, I would um, take a look at, you know, I, I don't know if you're saying your web visibility, if you're talking about your website visibility, if you're talking about in general visibility, but um, the steps I would take is really to I, I would look at investing in, like I said, uh, LinkedIn, because that's going to give you a pretty high return. Um, I would look at probably like a Facebook, um, because Facebook, you could do Facebook fundraisers, um, and then making sure that your website, um, you know, you're using a very good content management system like a WordPress or one of those, and that you're investing in Google, Google, Google grants, um, and um, making sure that you have a way of tracking how people uh, navigate your website so that you can you know improve the content all right so what did you discover about your organization's digital presence um i'm actually going to have you answer as i continue on because I'm, I'm i've been told i'm running out of time um but go ahead and take a look at that um and we'll we'll be able to kind of circle back to it uh portia will tell me what you've answered um okay Let's continue on. Now that we, you know, we've kind of looked at those other elements, I want to talk about how people think and how to activate them accordingly. So uh, according to Daniel Kahneman, our behavior is driven by two distinct systems. So if you're familiar with like behavioral science, uh, um, behavioral economics and decision science, this is really kind of, um, this, this comes out of that world. So we tend to think that people are very, very deliberate and, um, and rational and evaluative and conscious and logical. So if you ask Actually read a lot of NGO content. It's like so long. It's you know you really have to think a lot. Um, you know as you're kind of going through it. But actually that's not the way people think. The way people think is they're very emotional, instinctive, automatic, intuitive, and, and conscious. So it's important that you get to it. That you have it simple. That you use bullets. That you make it really easy for them to understand what you want them to do, why they should do it, and you know, and 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 the like. And so I'm gonna give you some um some quick tips uh, that are eight key drivers of online behavior, uh, which I need to go through really quickly, but we've got clarity, transparency, relevance, and anchoring, which increase motivation, and then um, uncertainty and perceived effort, and social proof and messenger, the choice of messenger, which remove friction from me, you know, taking action as a donor. So let's go into this. I'm going to give you this link to this video. It's actually embedded in here. I can't show it to you because they're, they're telling me I'm behind. But this is a, a, a video I've been showing forever. It's about three minutes long. Um, and, and it's from an organization called Charity Water and really does a great job of clearly um, telling their story 
and showing that problem, solution, impact, and ask in a really, really phenomenal way. So I encourage you to take a look at this video because you do have the link to the presentation. Maybe we can share it again if, 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 if they need it. Um, also around clarity of, of storytelling, this is again, integrating the uh, storytelling framework into one of uh, King Budwan Foundation US's other partners, this American Friends of Iconic Houses. So if you actually were to go through all this, you'd see how they integ integrate all those different elements in um, their storytelling on their fundraising page. Um, and then it's also important to, to practice transparency. Remember we spoke about the fact that donors need to feel that you're good stewards, right? And so anywhere you can, like let's say how UNICEF has here, they have their annual report, they have the different you know, financial reports you need to see. They also show that you know, their, their, their rating level with the two different um, important charity rating sites uh, for them so that you can go ahead and read a little bit here and also go on to those sites to learn more. So they're telling you right up front, you know, we're, we're efficient, we're verified, and, you know, don't, you don't have to worry about working with us because we do everything that's right. So think about whatever that is in your own context. Um, over on the right is from Charity Water. What they do, I think, is really smart is um, they share what show you like is, is, is if you're a donor like at five thousand dollar level and you're actually paying for one of the water projects that you know full water project to be developed um they give you the gps coordinates and you actually can if you go to their site you can drill down and see the specific project um and you can um you can see photographs of, as it's developing and videos and things like that and it also has a sensor so for the say the well or something goes down um you can receive as the donor you can receive um, a, a text message that lets you know what's going on with that. So you're really kept in the loop in terms of how that community is using that project um, and if there are any problems with it. And so that's really, really important because they can prove it. Um, and so I want you to think about what that could look like in your own context. Um, and then here's an example of communicating relevant information. So it's important for us to know, um, to be able to showcase who supports us, right? Who's part of what we're doing? Now, there's a balance that you wanna strike. You don't want people to think, oh, well, they have so many supporters, they don't need our help. So you've gotta be careful about that. But it's important that 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 we're able to see that you've been funded by fund, uh, you know a foundation that you've been funded maybe by your government maybe that you have you know really strategic partners um, who are credible and that for therefore that's lending credibility to you as an organization especially for the smaller ones so you want to think about that like how you would want to communicate that um, and then on the left this is from iconic houses I think this is really clever how they've done this and it's similar to uh, giving to um, charity water whereby they show you the scale of the work that they do in terms of these these houses that are preserved and whose history um, you know, they're, they're really helping to um, preserve. And so you can drill down and click on each, each particular house, learn about the history and the like. So it's a, just a great way for me to learn more about what they're doing. Rather than just reading a report, I can see it visually. It's a lot more compelling. It gets my attention right away. And that, that you can access right on the homepage. Um, the next thing is anchoring. So I've got to tell you, if you're going to go on your website and you, and you actually have a donation button um, or a donation page, please make sure it's really, really simple, really clear, um, and that you also really are deliberate about um, you know, whether you want people to give you on a monthly basis um, or, or once. So they're clear that they want you to give on a monthly basis, uh, not just once. And they also show you the amount that they're kind of looking for you to give. So this is called anchoring so that you, they say to you, okay, this is kind of like the neighborhood where we want you to be. This is what we'd like you to sort of, you know, where, 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 where would you, we would like you to, to donate. Um, and so that actually is kind of showing you how they want you to, to support them. So you've got to think a little bit about how you could do that for your own context um, and, and, and go from there. Um, and then this is really, again, this is a blowout of their, um, of, of their donation month. So this is a different donation page um, on their site. And here they're, it's for a particular thing where they're asking you to give once and for a higher amount. But what's important is they're telling you that 100% of your money brings um, clean water to people need. So for them, um, they happen to be in a position that, um, in such that their board members actually cover all their operating costs so that every, all the funds that they, that they raise in the public actually do go towards the, the project. So whatever that equivalent is for you, 85% of our, you know, all the funds raised go to 
the work that we do 90%, you wanna be able to let people know that and also let them know down here in the fine print that yes, it is tax, um, you know, they can get tax deduction and that this is a secure donation. If they're, if you have, you know, the ability to, for people to give on your site and then give them other ways to um, connect with you. So the easier you make this, um, and the more you reassure the person at this point where they're going to make that decision, um, the more likely it is that they will com complete that transaction. Let me continue on to um, rece reducing perceived effort. So this is from Curie Chicks, and I apologize that this is so small, but I had to I had to kind of um, uh, scratch it down, but this is from their site. And basically these are the different ways that they want you to get involved with them, right? So they want you to either give, add your name to um, you know, the legacy, mentor their students, hire their graduates, right? So that it's really simple, really clear. You click on the one that's relevant to you. There isn't a lot of guessing. There isn't a lot, of, there aren't a lot of words, but it's a very, very easy way for you to connect with them. So again, think about what that looks like in your context. Um, and then, then um, the next one is social proof. And this is from an event that we did last, um, earlier this year, uh, whereby we um, actually used LinkedIn to promote the event. Um, and we created a LinkedIn event, which anybody can do. Um, and here you're able to see that there are about 417 or so people uh, registered on that site um, for, for the event. And then you can, you know, look at the details. So what, what happens is when you receive an invitation to this event, it'll show you who else um, is going to that event, right? Which is sort of like that social proof, like, oh, if so-and-so is going yeah, then I, I feel comfortable going. And so that creates more motivation for you to register. But then when you register for the event, it then lets your followers know or your connections know that you just registered for this event. So that actually helps us to attract other people um, through that sort of social proof of who's going. So something you want to think about, um, Facebook does something similar, but I just think LinkedIn has a really great way of showing that. And then finally, it's important to think about the messenger you use for any of your communications, right? So in this particular example, um, there's a there there's a video that uh, UNICEF developed about a partnership it, it, it created with um, um, Formula E, and so they chose Ewan McGregor as an actor, a very famous actor, to promote this, and so. The thinking behind here would be to kind of leverage his star power, leverage his, you know, followers, um, and 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 you know provide that kind of of legitimacy to the work that they're doing. Yet on this side is um, a post about getting people vaccinated, and so the choice here is, um, you know, a medical professional um, who kind of speaks about, you know, you see she speaks about the importance of getting vaccinated and so on and so forth. You're probably more likely to listen to her about getting vaccinated than you are to him. So just think very carefully about who it is that's um you know you're 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 showing in your posts the who, who it is that's doing your videos who it is you're taking to meetings and, and the like really really important that um you know you're you're really very strategic about that okay so we're going to talk about sharing your organization's story via social media um i have a couple of questions that have come through to me but what i'd like you to answer for me is um, which of the following social media platform does your organization use to engage donors and other supporters? Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. Okay. No one's on TikTok <laughs> or Clubhouse. <laughs> All right, so Facebook's very, very important. Uh, not surprising, I'm imagining many of you are on the African continent because uh, Facebook's really, really important there. Um, LinkedIn, 75, okay, good to see LinkedIn is up there too. Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, a little WhatsApp. WhatsApp is, is, is gaining some momentum. No TikTok? <laughs> uh, Okay, so Facebook's really, really important for you, and I'm I, and and I'm glad to see that. Now I'm going to share. This is like my little poll of you, but let me share share some of the, the statistics for you, with you um, online. This is an excellent report. It's a Global Trends and Giving report, um, and you can click here to download the report for free. It's it's it shows you um, kind of you know they they went ahead and I think they they surveyed like maybe like. I don't know, 13, 14,000 people um, who are donors uh, to understand their giving patterns online, 
which platforms are most important to them. And they do, you actually can see the results by continent uh, and then overall. Um, I am giving you an overview from, 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 from the site and I'll give you the African continent as well as um, in Europe. But as you can see here, um, interestingly enough, the donors online are primarily baby boomers, which I wouldn't have even guessed, uh, Gen Xers and millennials. So Gen Z is really, really not a significant amount, but I think it's also, it's just, they may, they may not have as much money to give, but so, so a lot of the giving is really here. So when you're thinking about your messaging, you know, are you making sure that you're appealing to someone who is, you know, in, in that, in those age ranges, right? Um, it also shows you the types of causes that are supported by donors worldwide. So hunger and homelessness um, are really important. Children and youth, health, animals and wildlife, faith and spirituality, human social services, environmental arts, international development and education. So that kind of gives you the prioritization of, of the causes that they're interested in. If we look at um, the in African continent, giving um, in terms of platform. So here's what it is. I, I asked about social media, but here are the, the ways that um, people feel inspired to give. So it's either through an email, that's the highest, right? An email coming to them, followed by content on your website, a phone call, an ad, and, and the like. And then here, they say that those who are inspired by social media, 40, Facebook is um, is really like the leader there, then followed by WhatsApp, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and then YouTube. So it's a little bit different from what you all shared with me, but that is on the African continent. In Europe, um, the, the ways, the preferred method of giving um, is through bank wire and transfer, PayPal, cash, text to give, um, and, and, and so on. Um, but you can actually learn a lot more from the report. I just kind of highlighted a couple of things uh, from, from, from this, but it's an excellent, excellent report and it's free. So let me give you th uh, three channels that I want to share some, um, to sh share, help you with. One is WhatsApp. I wrote an article about this last year and it's four ways to boost your nonprofit digital storytelling with WhatsApp. And the four ways are really um, helping you to manage your team virtually, which was at the time when COVID hit, was really important because a lot of organizations didn't really know how to do that. So talk a little bit about how to effectively use that as a tool um, um, to, to manage their team, to your teams, especially if you can um, obtain a WhatsApp business profile. It does not pay. It's not, it's not an, a paid a profile, but it's a profile you can now access on, on your computer uh, and manage everything that you need to manage um, on there. And then there's like, you know, there's, they have, um, they give you the ability to have up to eight people on a conference call, on a video call. Um, so you can use it for your meetings if, if Zoom isn't necessarily what you need to use in a particular time. Uh, it's also a great place for you to share information with your different supporters. Um, and then it also talk a little bit about the business profile you can set up. And I talk about the opportunity to fundraise. And why this is important is WhatsApp is owned by Facebook. And if you've ever made a donation on Facebook, um, you can see it's basically like one or two clicks to make it. It's very simple. So they've integrated that payment functionality into, into WhatsApp. So you can actually um, you know, have a post asking people to fund, you know, to donate to something and give them a link that gives them a couple of steps to go ahead and donate to you. So it's a very efficient way to uh, uh, fundraise. Take, you know, click here and you can read the article. Um, the next is an article I wrote earlier this year, a couple months ago on LinkedIn. And I encourage you greatly to read this article. I put a lot of time in it and it's really providing you with five best practices to activate your supporters on that platform. Um, one was really finding a way to promote your organization's brand online. Um, you know, so having a company page um, that, that, people can, you know, that, that your organization's page, then making sure that your employees' LinkedIn profiles are all connected to that page. So, because what happens is, let's say if I'm uh, researching your organization, because I'm a prospective funder, and I want to understand who, who works there, what it's all about, I need to have as many people connected to it, and your employees, your board and stuff, to see if there's a linkage to, to me. And the same way when you are when you as an organization are conducting research on LinkedIn for funders and the like, if you um, are able to connect your employees' LinkedIn page to your um, profiles to your page, when you're searching foundations or you're searching any 
any kind of funder, you'll be able to see where the linkage is between your organization through your employees or your board members and that particular funder. So it just creates greater opportunities for you to be discovered, as well as for you to discover those prospective partners you're looking for. Uh, the next is using this as a tool to build your brand by showcasing your impact and, and obtaining insights. So you know, whenever you have any kind of research you're conducting, or if you have any kind of um, reports that you're, you're sh sh sharing, this is a really great platform to do so, uh, to share those. And also, um, you can use this, the platform to um, go ahead and get sort of insights from them, right? So there are ways for you to conduct polls, understand what supporters are interested in. Um, and the, the way that they react to your po posts tells you what's interesting to them. Um, so it's a really, really good site for that. Um, and then the third is promoting your events, as I showed you earlier with the LinkedIn events. A uh, very powerful way for you to build, your, bring your network all together around promotion of an event. Um, and then, you know, the, the event can either take place on LinkedIn, which it doesn't have to, or you can have it um, online somewhere else. And you have a link to, for people to be able to watch that event somewhere else, or it can even be in person, but it's a very good way for you to, to use that social proof to get as many people as possible to participate. Um, and then you can also use LinkedIn Live. Now, LinkedIn Live is only available if you get approved. You can't, it's just not an automatic thing, but um, I found it to be very useful in, 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 in attracting people because the minute you go live, all your followers are notified that you're that you're live, um, and you'd be surprised who tunes in and sees what you're doing. So, um, think about LinkedIn Live, and then finally, using LinkedIn to uh, research and engage prospects through LinkedIn Sales Navigator, um, and that enables you with an upgraded uh, upgraded uh, profile to be able to really do some very significant research. Now, I want to share with you that nonprofit organizations get 50% off of all LinkedIn products. I don't get paid from them, so it's not me, but I just want to let you know that. And they also have um, grant opportunities and other sort of um, uh, really valuable um, offerings that they have. If you click on the article, I gave you links to learn more about all of that, but I highly encourage you to read this if you don't have anything else, time to read anything else. And then this is 10 Facebook best practices for nonprofits. Nonprofit Tech for Good is a great, great, great uh, platform for any of you who are really wanting to learn more about digital storytelling and fundraising. It's run by a woman named Heather Mansfield. And so she wrote this article and speaks, um, you can click to the article and it really gives you uh, 10 different things that you can, th you can really do to leverage Facebook for um, engaging your your uh, supporters. Um, so let's see. They, you know, they say that you should have your nonprofit should have a Facebook page. But here's something you also need to understand: you have to invest in Facebook ads because. At this point, only like about 2% of your content is going to be found organically. So even if you have a million followers, um, they're not all going to be seeing your content anymore. And so you're, you really have to be able to make that investment in, in Facebook ads for your, your content to be discovered. Uh, the other thing you want to think about is you know, the posting frequency, um, you know, you, you want to be in a position where you can post uh, fairly regularly. Um, and then you also want to make sure that you use a donate button on your page. Um, I've seen organizations that may have a subscribe button or they may have a different button that's on the top of their page, but donate is really what you want to be able to have. Obviously you have to get qualified for that, but that is something that you really want to um, have uh, people be able to do is donate on, on that platform because it's really, really easy. Um, and then also give your supporters an easy way to fundraise for your organization, right? So. Um, I can either donate to you directly um, as, you know, as Liz, or I as Liz can create a fundraiser on behalf of your organization. Um, and I and I leverage all of my contacts to be able to support your organization. So you want to make sure that you give people the ability to do both. Um, and then you want to look at like um, then subscriptions, which is a new kind of um, um, offering that they have. I'm not as familiar with it, but you can read more about what she wrote about. Um, you can use Facebook Messenger to get to, to get your messages directly to your uh, supporters, um, and then experiment with Facebook Stories, which I've you know kind of had different um, experience with, but something worth looking at. Uh, Facebook Live, in the same way that LinkedIn Live 
enables you to go live immediately and have your followers um, connect, you know, see the content you're sharing. It's a really good way for you to have that good regular conversation and dialogue with, with your folks, or if you have your virtual events, a good way for you to do so. Uh, and then absolutely schedule a time, you know, at least once a month to learn more about all the different ways you can use Facebook. I mean, they have tremendous resources um, that you can use. The Facebook for nonprofits um, um, uh, is a really, really good uh, offering that they have you can learn about they I mean like they have webinars they have a blog that you can read there's a page you can follow and really great great tips from them um, and then finally uh, last month or actually about a, I don't even know a month two months ago uh, we launched the new digital fundraising certificate program at New York University um, I wrote an article summary with my my colleague Portia um, a summary about the webinar and then you can click here and you can watch the uh, webinar itself to get some more digital fundraising tips. Uh, and now um, I've also provided you with a social media cheat sheet. If you click here, you'll be able to, to access it, but it gives you the best times that you can post for these different platforms, um, days a week, as well as uh, times during the day. And um, now I'm ready to answer your questions. Let's see, there's some questions that have been coming through. Um, Okay. Do I need to create a page for my organization on LinkedIn? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> That's how you want to do it. And there's a different, sometimes people create pages or they create groups. Groups are different. You want to have a page which can be, can be found. The group would be like if you had an alumni group or smaller group that you want to bring together to um, connect around a particular topic, you can do that. But I encourage you to set up a Facebook, a LinkedIn page, and I show you, I provide you with a link in my article how, for you to how you can do so. How many clicks should a donor take to make an online donation? <laughs> Probably like three. You got to keep it really simple. What it is is the more I have to think, the more I have to do, uh, the more likely I am to abandon, right? So don't have me fill millions of forms and don't make me have to go through lots of different steps. If I can really, um, up, you know, if I can make a donation fairly quickly, like in two or three steps, that's great. Something to note is if, if you're having people make a donation on your site, giving them the option to do so through PayPal is really, really important. Like I won't transact with a company I'm not familiar with or, or donate to an organization I'm not familiar with if they don't have a PayPal um, um, kind of, functionality and then for me to be able to make a donation through PayPal, or I'd prefer to give through their Facebook page or give, give through their global giving page or one of the sites like, you know, or, or King by the Web Foundation, US's page where I, I trust those sites. And I know that, you know, my information is not as likely to be compromised as on a smaller organization's website. That's not necessarily secure. Um, how do you find the right pool of people to connect with on, on LinkedIn? Well, one place you can start is the people who are in this webinar. Like, uh, you know, a lot of times when I'm at events and I, I, I actually connect with people um, during those events so that I can go ahead and, um, you know, connect with people who are like-minded, who have similar interests to mine. So that's one way. Um, if you participate in, in a LinkedIn live event, look at the people who participate in that and connect with them. Um, but most importantly, it's really understanding who, you know, what do you have to offer? What are you about? And, you know, what is it, what kind of person is going to be attracted to that or attracted to your organization? And so um, it's really taking advantage of when you come to events, when you're, you know, any of your alumni engagement, anything like that, and connecting with people right away. So when I meet people, I immediately connect with them on LinkedIn. One, because when you send an email to someone after you've met them, you don't, can't put the face with the name, but on LinkedIn, um, if I connect with you on LinkedIn, I can see your face right away on, on, on the profile and I can read a little bit about you. And I can send a little follow-up note and just say, it was great meeting you. Oh, I noticed that we have such and such in common, or I noticed something that you're doing um, that creates a connection right away. So I, I definitely think that that's one way to, um, um, one way to look at that. How do you get the right followers to follow your organization? Look for organizations similar to yours and court those followers. And so one way you can do that is through um, targeted advertising um, and any of these platforms to say, I'm looking for followers of this page who have this kind of a profile. 
Um, can you serve my ad to them so that I can attract them to me? I mean, it takes a little bit of, of, of effort, but you know, that's one way you can do it. Um, and then, um, or if there's a, if there's a foundation that you're interested in or even an individual and they have their profile open, you can like their content. If you engage with their content, you're eventually going to get their attention, right? So, um, that's one way, but it's really important to understand what your story is and then look for those who are interested in that story who be, and they show that by who they're connected with, who they're funding and other efforts in which they're involved. Um, Okay, so the best software for knowledge management. I would encourage you to take a look at Salesforce's um, offerings. Um, they are really, really good. Um, they really do. Um, I think I gave you a link to one of their the to one of their reports. You'll be able to click through to to get to them. But they do a really, really great job um, of of knowledge management, donor management, um, and the like. All right, let's talk about the university endowment funds and how to tell their story. So our crowdfunding and endowment are facing some challenges because our donors do not see the instant effect. Um, yeah, university endowment, that's a very, that's a that's something that really requires a very, very specific skill set and a very specific strategy. Um, you want to have um, like your choice of kind of the chair of that choice of the people who are going to sort of lead that and who you fundraise from to begin with is going to drive your ability to be effective when you go into the crowdfunding part. So, I mean, it, it, I think that you it starts with the chair and what resources you already have um, that you've secured um, that will then, that you can use to leverage when you go out to the, to the market, to the public, to connect with them. Uh, it's not my area of expertise, but I just know that it's important that you have the right chair. Um, with you. Okay, um, let's see. So if you're trying to find out whether or not you qualify for Google Ad Grants, I literally would Google Google Ad Grants, <laughs> Google, uh, Google Ad Grant um, requirements. Um, and then you can see if your country is um, your country and then your specific organization uh, fits the criteria that they're looking for. How can I leverage my organization's WhatsApp network to convert supporters into donors? WhatsApp is our most popular social media. So that, that's why I sent you, I wrote an article about that. So you can take a look at that. Um, and I shared the link to it as well. But you know, one of the ways that you can really take a, leverage that, that group is really looking at it. You know, if they're very engaged with you, if they're, if they're commenting and they're sharing your content, you could actually, you, you could convert them into fundraisers on your behalf by, you know, by creating ways for them to create fundraisers for, for your organization. So um, you would share the fundraising content in that WhatsApp group that you probably have set up and ask if they could share, uh, you know, outside of that. Um, and also even using opportunities to, to, um, to poll them, find out, find out what's of interest to them, find out, you know, how it is that they want to be engaged with you. I mean, it's a really easy way to do it. You could use like a Google poll. You could even use Slido if you want. Uh, there's a free version of Slido that you could get uh, to be able to do that. But you want to understand from them what's of interest. Um, and how can a Facebook donate button if you're based in Africa? Well, um, I think you need to talk to Hafiza and see um, if if there's a bill, there's a way for you to be able to use the fiscal sponsors site to be able to have a Facebook donate button, but it, there's a whole bunch of qualification for that type of thing. But um, yeah, so you would you would need to have like a friends of account or you need to have an actual like, like US arm of, or, or Europe, European arm of your organization, um, unless you can demonstrate um, somehow that you're adhering to uh, what they need you to adhere to. So countries like South Africa have that, the ability to, to to um, have Facebook but donate buttons, but it, it's on a case by case basis. So for you, I would say go ahead and Google, um, get Facebook donate button in, you know, or qualify to do Facebook fundraise in, in whichever country you're in. And then it can tell you um, a little bit about how to go about doing so. All right, let's see. I think there's some questions that were also sent to me. Okay, I got that already. Um, all right, I think what I want to do is if there are any other questions, uh, please feel free to keep sharing them with me.
I have about seven more minutes of questions that I can take. Okay, so let me go back to that, how to find, get the right followers to follow your organization. Um, so when you're doing, when you, when, you, when you do a digital strategy for your organization, you define who it is that, you know, who is, who is the follower, who, is the, who are the followers, who are the donors you want to attract? And then you, then you um, determine the platforms or which channels you're going to communicate through to reach those audiences, um, whether it's through paid um, advertising um, or organic uh, posting and, and sharing. Um, and really it's, it's, it has to do with understanding what it is, what's your unique value proposition, you know, and, and who is going to be attracted to that? And one way to know that is who follows your competitors, who's connecting and giving to your competitors. And you can find that out when you do advertising through these different platforms. I know that we probably all want to do things um, as inexpensively as possible, but um, it's important that you make that investment because that's how you get the donations. You know, you have to spend money to make money, right? And so um, I would absolutely take a look at, at how to go ahead and do targeting um, on any one of these different platforms. Okay, I'd like to know how nonprofits are using TikTok and podcasts to promote their causes. Um, okay, TikTok and podcasts, two different things, but okay. Um, so podcasts give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about what you do, what your organization sort of um, you know, the impact that it's making, um, if, if you're in the research space, any kind of research that you're conducting, and it gets people, lets people understand what you're all about. Once you have them uh, participating in your podcast, you do have the ability to um, have them become subscribers and you have the ability to then communicate with them. And I wouldn't say that you want me to ask a donation right away, but if you listen to podcasts, a lot of times they'll say to you, you know, we 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 um, exist on on donations, and if you want to continue to receive this valuable content or or learn more about what we're doing and get involved, here's how you can support us. So you can make the ask in those. TikTok, um, how to use TikTok for nonprofits? I honestly have not used TikTok. Um, it's something that I have been kind of monitoring for a long time. I do have a link to an article about it, which um, I can share as an, a follow-up to this event, or if if the specific person who asked for it, give please just copy your um, your email into the text and I'll be happy to share to send the article to you, or you can send um, a, a direct, direct message to Portia, uh, P-O-R-T-I-A, and she can make sure that I can get in touch with you and share that article with you where you can learn more. Okay, um, let's see. My board doesn't understand how an online presence can increase fundraising. How do I demonstrate the value of web visibility in a very short span of time to make a case? Um, well, part of your board's responsibility, if you have agreements with them, are, is to be, it's for them to be your, um, okay, wait, of oh, the online presence. Okay, well, I was thinking about their presence. Um, how do you demonstrate the value of web visibility? I, sh I shared some reports with you, right? I mean, the reports, I like to use benchmark reports to make cases. So if let's say this year, this past year in terms of giving there, I think it was about 32% um, increase in online giving versus a regular giving was like maybe 12% increase. People are giving much more online. Um, and especially because we live much more online and with COVID that is happening, you can't afford to, um, not have some kind of an online presence. And if you're trying to find new funders, um, if you're looking to find new audiences, that's how you do it. It's actually the most cost-effective way to do so is online, um, much more cost-effective than some of the, you know, sort of like major, if you're doing major gift fundraising and endowments and things, that requires a lot higher investment up front. And so that's 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 how I would make the case. And, and, and the, the reality is, when you meet anybody, when you when you apply for anything, the first thing they do is they Google you, just like I had to just Google yourselves. So it's important for them to understand that we live in that kind of world now. You know, when I started teaching this at New York University in 2009, it was kind of a nice to have, I think, for a lot of organizations. They're like, yeah, we like to be online, but it's not a priority. 
it's no longer the case. You have to be. If you're not, it's you're you you're completely missing out on opportunities to not only engage your um, existing supporters but also prospective ones, um, and to um, showcase your 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 beneficiaries because you don't know who could be inspired with what by what you're doing. But more importantly, because I think this is fundraising, it give it gives people an efficient way to to donate to you, um, and. It's just how we do business now. <laughs> that's that's all I can say. Um, okay, so I've got two more minutes that I can answer questions, um, and then I'm going to wrap it up. Okay, based on my experience, what are some of the common areas most donors are interested in? Well, um, I, I think it all depends on who you're, which donors you're talking about. Um, you know, here's, here's, here, here's how I'm going to say it. Most people think donors, like individual donors donate, um, you know, because they want a tax break. That's somewhere, and that's important so on some level, but the number one reason why people give is because they want to be part of something bigger. They want to feel that they're making a difference. And so that's what I'm saying to you, when you talk about your impact, when you're sharing impact, you've got to do it within the context of the, the larger impl larger implications of what you're doing. And so this gives me a great opportunity because you asked that question to go back. I'm gonna show you that charity water video because I have a little bit of time and then I'm gonna wrap it up. So just give me one second. Let me go back to, to it and show it to you. I think this will answer your question. And I think all of you will see why I love this video. Awesome. Can you hear my audio? Um, yes? Yes, but it's a little bit blurry, a cloudy, the audio. No, no, we don't hear the audio. No? No. Okay, let me, let me, sorry, let me, let me share again, sorry. Give me one second. I'm going to reshare this. Sorry, folks. Just give me one second. I'm going to reshare it. Um, these are the technical <laughs> technical things that we have. Stop share, and I'm going to reshare with the audio because I didn't do the audio to begin with. Sorry about that. Um, but it's all about recovery. Okay, so let's go ahead and try it again. most basic need. But there's a water crisis in our world right now. Seriously, a crisis. Nearly one billion people live without clean drinking water. It's happening all over the world, especially in developing areas of Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, and Latin America. It's a water crisis most basic in our world right now. Seriously, a crisis. Nearly one billion people live without clean drinking water. It's happening all over the world, especially in developing areas of Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, and Latin America. It's a water crisis because it starts with water. But water affects everything. Education, health, poverty, and especially women and children. Let's look at a family caught in the water crisis. It's likely they live on less than a dollar a day. When they're thirsty, they can't just turn on the faucet for a nice cold glass of water. They don't have a faucet. Instead, the women and children go off to collect water. Many walk up to three hours a day to the nearest swamp, pond, or river to gather water that's been sitting out in the open, exposed to all kinds of germs. Time spent gathering water is time they can't spend learning to read, write, earn an income, or take care of their family. Some women in Sub-Saharan Africa spend more time collecting water than any other activity they do in the day. And the walk isn't just hard, it's dangerous. The women are alone and burdened with 40 pounds of water. Many get hurt. Sometimes they're even attacked. 
When they make it home, the little water they've collected isn't clean. Some families know their water is contaminated with germs that cause diarrhea, dehydration, even death. But what choice do they have? Kids, especially babies, are affected most by these germs. About every 19 seconds, a mother loses one of her children to a water-related illness. And each day, almost a billion people are living this way. Until they get a little help. The water crisis is solvable. There are solutions. Some are brand new and innovative, like water filtration systems. Some are age old, like drilled or hand dug wells. These solutions bring clean water much closer to the people who need it. A safe water project near a village restores hours each day to a person's life. This time, it's opportunity. It's freedom to go to school and get an education, to work or start a business, to raise a family. Africa alone could save 40 billion hours each year. That's the entire annual workforce of France. Clean water means less disease. That's less money spent on medicine, which means more money for books and school uniforms. And if the water project is built near a school, it can increase attendance, especially among young girls. The water crisis is vast, but we... Okay, you've got, and then they say join us. That's basically it. But you have the video to watch. It's a great video. And they, this organization has had 44,000 people create fundraisers on their behalf. So absolutely take advantage of learning about more about charity water. Um, let me go ahead and take us out because um, I need to go ahead and wrap us up. And I appreciate your time because it's been a long uh, session. But here's a couple more events for you to prepare for Giving Tuesday. Um, on Wednesday, we have Giving to Givers and Friends Fest uh, in which we're involved. And you'll be able to hear directly from Canva, from Facebook, from Google, from all of those platforms, even TikTok, the person who asked for TikTok, you'll be able to hear directly about them in terms of how to create your Giving Tuesday campaign using their platforms. I will also be speaking, really um, looking at how to use digital storytelling here, but specifically for Giving Tuesday. Um, so um, you absolutely can participate for free and please share it with other folks. Um, and then um, next Monday, I will be with Kathleen Murphy Toms, who is, is Giving Tuesday's digital strategy head. Um, and we're going to be doing an open Q&A session. So instead of the presentation like I did today, you'll be able to ask your questions in advance. Um, so go ahead and register for free. And if you have any specific questions that you need help with in advance, we created um, a survey that you will receive um, when you register. And through that survey, you can communicate any questions you have and we'll be able to prepare in advance for you. But that's really gonna be like coming to like office hours with us. It's gonna be an open Q&A from 9 a.m. to um, 10 30 uh, a.m. Eastern time, Eastern Standard Time, and you see all the different time zones. Um, and that's a free event. And then um, other additional resources, you've got um, thought leadership on our website that you can see articles and videos and things that we've created uh, around digital storytelling. And then any of our other events we have coming up, you can learn about them. Um, and then this is about the digital fundraising certificate program at New York University that I developed. And you can learn about our courses there. Uh, and then finally, I want to know what's the most important thing you learned from today's session. So the most important thing we learned from today's session, and I thank you so much for joining us today, in our, but I really must hear from you. I want to know what landed. I uh, spent a lot of time putting this presentation together, and I want to see what actually was mo really resonated the most with you. And I'm hoping that this, um, the way that this was interactive enabled you to um, really immediately um, implement at least one of the things that we that I shared with you. So four elements of storytelling, all, 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 that's awesome. Donors needs, absolutely. Study the channels. Um, LinkedIn, LinkedIn's the most effective platform for fundraising. Not for, <laughs> it's the most effective platform for engaging with professionals. Um, so I would absolutely say that, but LinkedIn's important. Um, and problem solution impact, call to action, study, Remember to keep the user donor simple life. Okay, make it easy for donors to donate. Exactly. You gotta keep things as simple as possible. The more I have to think, the more I have to do, the harder I have to work, the less likely I am to do something. So those are real, all really, really um, great sharings. And when you hear from more of you and see what else you're coming up with, 
the power of LinkedIn. So LinkedIn seems to be like the thing that really stuck with most of you. Um, also making it easy for donors to um, engage or to donate um, that you must, you must uh, register about El Elgon Foundation on LinkedIn. Absolutely, absolutely you must. <laughs> uh, and, and invite me to follow it. I'd be happy to follow that page um, as I wanna see what you do. I'm, I'll be really happy to learn once you've set it up and make sure that when you're telling the story, you're using the storytelling elements, um, four elements of storytelling, social proof and messengers. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, understanding the hierarchy of donors needs. Yep. Uh, yeah, these are all very powerful um, takeaways that you got. I, I'm, I'm really glad that, that these resonated with you. Uh, and I would really love to see that you actually implement these. So um, you can get in touch with me through my website, um, also on LinkedIn, please connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, maybe they'll provide my LinkedIn um, profile link for you to connect with me and let me know, you know, how you've used what you learned today. Um, I, it's very important to me that when I teach and that I'm actually helping you to take an action, right, to activate you, because that's why I do what I do. I don't want you to just learn information for the sake of having it but so that you can actually um, more easily do your job in supporting the communities that you serve um, and helping us all to make the world a better place. That's why I do all of this. And I'm so grateful that you joined us today. I'm so grateful to have heard from all of you. Uh, please get in touch with me. I believe my, my LinkedIn profile was shared. You can get in touch with me from my website. Um, and um, I hope that the slides are helpful to you and I hope that this, you found this to be value. Thank you so very much to everybody who participated. Um, and I definitely want to go ahead and thank all of our partners uh, for this session. So I know you'll continue to answer us, but thank you to everybody. Thank you to King Baudouin Foundation US, Giving Tuesday to African Resource Network, Candid, European Fundraising Association, Nigerian Network of NGOs, and of course, you. Uh, and thank you to um, the team from Faircom that supported our efforts to be able to produce a very uh, seamless event experience for you. And my colleague, Portia, who made sure that you received all the links you needed and helped me to create this event for you. So thank you very much. And thank you, Hafiza, for the opportunity. And thank you, Jean-Paul, for the opportunity as well. Everyone be safe. Um, we will be in touch and hope that you absolutely do register for the next couple events we have lined up for you. That's the Giving uh, Tuesday Summit on Wednesday, which is an all-day summit. And then next Monday, the office hours or Q&A with Kathleen Murphy-Toms and I on how to bring your Giving Tuesday campaign um, to exactly the way you need it to be to raise funds and also to engage people because Giving Tuesday is not just about uh, raising money, although 17% of money is raised uh, or, or donations are raised on Giving Tuesday. It's also about activating people to support you in other ways through volunteering um, um, and things like that. Another thing that you should know is Giving Tuesday is not just there's Giving Tuesday, but there are also Giving Days that you can create of your own. So Giving every Tuesday. Um, so you can use that model to activate your supporters on on, on, on on other days that are, um, are specific to you and what you're all about. So I highly encourage you to join us. Um, it looks like people are still, are you still writing? No, we, we're good on that. But thank you very much to everybody and be well. Um, and I think, I think the production team will stay on with you or I'm not sure, Lindsay, you've got to t t tell us what we should do now. We will uh, close the session. Unfortunately, we, we have to close this down, um, but everyone, the recording will be sent out with the resources after the session ends. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.